remember today, Good Friday, as a day that Jesus paid that ultimate sacrifice. Today, as followers of Christ, Christians. And so tonight, I'm going to be doing a song in a language called Igbo is my language. Um, it's from the southeastern part of Nigeria. And I ask us to stand as we worship tonight. It's a song that we know. At some point, I believe we'll be able to follow. Nani na Christ, koli la nyamdi, obu ihem ike. Kume na la di ke ke guzoni me bili miri ihu na nyando do kasi me ihu jodi hisi ke la o nyeng kasi. Blood of Christ, but we. 
with the precious blood of Christ. So I know how this story We will be with you again You're my savior, my defense No more fear in life or death Good evening church, I want to sing this again And I want us to declare this out that we know how the story ends, that even Friday looks dark, that Sunday's coming. Let's sing this again. Oh, I know how this story ends. We will be with you again. You're my Savior, my defense.
Sing that to him now. We sing. Great are you, Lord. Tell him now how great he is. We say, Great are you, Lord. More than we know, more than we can say. Great. 
how great he is. Tell him how much you love him, how much we appreciate. Oh, how great you are. Oh, how great you are. You stand alone. So lift your voice saying, oh, and all the earth will shout your praise in our hearts.
shout Jesus from the mountains, Jesus in the streets, Jesus in the darkness over every enemy. And Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name, Jesus. Good Friday. How can one describe such a day? 
The wrongdoing of all humanity, putting to an end an innocent man, the Son of God. This is the story of Jesus' death by way of a cross, all in one moment bringing death to the bright light of our future. He never stopped loving us, and yet this is the incredible part of it. Our sin stopped his heart. Our sin drove the nails firmly in the hands of God. All along, these were the plans. We told ourselves that we were in control, and this was deemed sufficient for all of us. The brutal beating, the inhuman flogging, the naked humiliation. Heaven watched and saw it all. Our rebellion, our guilt, our shame, erasing the very notion of reconciling us with God. Our sin and our debt, overcoming Jesus. Here is our king, obliterated. The enemy laughing, his plans unstoppable. There's no longer the sound of freedom rising. Now God's people are utterly broken. Behold the chains of mortality. Yes, this is what is true. We had heard the stories of old. The lost are found, the blind can see, the weak are made strong. But now we are witnesses to this reality. God is dead. We'd almost believed there is a way of redemption. There is a life of fulfillment. There is a peace beyond understanding. Now we know better. For us, we can say that God is encapsulated in this one realization. The single greatest sacrifice in human history is finished. How clearly we can see it. So what's so good about Good Friday? Just one thing, that the blood of Jesus can reverse the curse of sin and raise the dead to life. How clearly we can see it is finished. The single greatest sacrifice in human history encapsulated in this one realization. We can say that God is for us. Now we know better. There is a peace beyond understanding. There is a life of fulfillment. There is a way of redemption. We had almost believed God is dead, but now we are witnesses to this reality. The weak are made strong. The blind can see. The lost are found. We had heard the stories of old. Yes, this is what is true. The chains of mortality utterly broken. Behold, freedom rising. Now God's people are unstoppable. There's no longer the sound of the enemy laughing. His plans obliterated. Here is our King, Jesus, overcoming our sin and our debt, reconciling us with God, erasing the very notion of our rebellion, our guilt, our shame. Heaven watched and saw it all, the naked humiliation, the inhuman flogging, the brutal beating, and this was deemed sufficient for all of us. We told ourselves that we were in control. All along, these were the plans firmly in the hands of God. Our sin drove the nails, our sin stopped his heart, and yet this is the incredible part of it. He never stopped loving us. The bright light of our future all in one moment bringing death to death by way of a cross. This is the story of Jesus, the Son of God, an innocent man putting to an end the wrongdoing of all humanity. How can one describe such a day? Good Friday. <laughs> This is, uh, this is from Mark chapter 15, beginning in verse 25. It reads, It was nine in the morning when they crucified him. 
The written notice of the charge against him read, the king of the Jews. They crucified two rebels with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads, saying, So, you who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, come down from the cross and save yourself. In the same way, the chief priests and the teachers of the law mocked him among themselves. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. Let this Messiah, this King of Israel, come down now from the cross that we may see and believe. Those crucified with him heaped, heaped also heaped insults on him. At noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And at three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lema sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing near heard this, they said, listen, he's calling Elijah. Someone ran, filled a sponge with wine vinegar and put it on a staff, offered it to Jesus to drink. Now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to take him down, he said. And with a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. The curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood there in front of Jesus saw how he died, he said, surely this man was the son of God. I'd like us to read Isaiah 40, verse 8 together on three. One, two, three. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of our God endures forever. And all God's people said, amen. amen. Let's pray. Uh, Father in heaven, holy is your name. There is no one like you, Father, no one who loves like you, gives like you, no one who saves like you. We thank you for the gift of your son. We thank you for the gift of the life that we are able to experience in his name. And so tonight we come together to say thank you for a sacrifice. And it's in the great name of Jesus Christ that we pray. Amen. So over 20 centuries ago now, in the darkness of night stood one solitary figure in a garden known as Gethsemane. He had been to this space many times before, but on this night it was to pray. And while those whom he had asked to keep watch fell in and out of sleep, he prayed with such intensity that his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. This was the blood of Jesus. Now, in the weeks uh, leading into and during the Holy Week, I spend quite a bit of time in what might be described as sort of a cone, cone of silence. And it's basically a time for me to read and to study and to pray and to seek God on direction um, for what he desires for me to share with you all um, each Good Friday and Resurrection Sunday. We've been in this teaching series, uh, The Big Story, looking at well-known Old Testament stories and seeing how they find their fulfillment in uh, the story and life and message and ministry, resurrection, and the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And so for this weekend, quite literally, we have saved the best for last. Tonight, we look to the cross of Jesus. And on Sunday, when we arrive at his tomb, which was no longer occupied, we will reach the apex, the summit of the greatest story of all. Now, our God and the character and nature of our God has often been misunderstood for many, many reasons. As I was thinking about this, an image came to my mind from a far side cartoon. When thinking about this, so you see this, this is called a God at his computer. And so what you have there is you have on the screen, you have a man and a piano over his head. And God is sort of at the ready with his finger over a button that has the word smite, which means to strike a firm blow on it. The idea being that if you have a computer button dedicated to a singular word, then it's probably used quite often. So this is a, this is a picture that presents a story. It presents one story, one idea about the possible nature and character of God. Now, as a counterpoint to that image, we have the Apostle John and his words from 1 John uh, chapter 4, beginning in verse 7 which read, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is what? God is love. Now, the final three words of verse 8 may not seem bold to us today, but in John's world, in the ancient world, a place where for many the gods were to be strictly appeased and feared and where it was assumed at best they held a cold distance from humanity. In that world, John's words that God is love were both bold and revolutionary. 
And I believe they reflected his understanding of what the events that we come together every single year to celebrate and remember communicate to us. The cross for millions of people all over the world tonight, they tell a much better story than that image that we saw earlier. A story that has within it the power to change lives and to awaken souls to the truth about who our God actually is. So tonight, I've got a passive scripture I felt led to for tonight, and then another one that I felt led to for the weekend as a whole. So it's always like a two-part deal going on here, okay, this weekend. So the first comes from the letter uh, to the churches in Galatia. Uh, And so this is Galatians chapter 3, beginning in verse 23. It reads, before the coming of this faith, where you see in this little passage, faith is like, it's the coming of Jesus, sort of new covenant faith. Before the coming of this faith, we were held in custody under the what? Under the law, locked up until the faith that was to come would be revealed. So the law was our, this is an interesting word, was our guardian until Christ came that we might be justified by faith. Now that this faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. So now where you see the word law, this is referring right to the Old Testament and to the law of Moses. God makes promises or covenants, right, throughout the Old Testament. Uh, We have seen it with Adam and Noah, Abraham, Moses, and David. And while the people are not able to hold really up to their end of the bargain, they just fall into sin over and over again. God, throughout the story, continues to keep his promise. And ultimately, the law of Moses comes into play to bring greater definition is what is his, what, on what is expected in the relation between God and his people. So the law enters in in a way as God continues to fight to maintain and sustain this relationship. In Galatians, the Apostle Paul, he's writing to some of the earliest Christians about this new era that has now arrived in and through Jesus Christ. So you have old era, new era, old covenant, new covenant. He writes that before Jesus, God, uh, God's people were held to the law. The law functioned as a sort of spiritual guardian. A way, again, to keep people in relationship with God. But then Jesus comes and he changes everything. And we see this in Galatians 4, verse 4, where it says, But when the set time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, that's Christmas, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, that we might receive what? Might receive adoption to sonship. Because you are his sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. So you're no longer a slave, but God's child. And since you're his child, God made you also an heir. And so with the coming of Jesus, what happens is, is there's this move for those who put their trust in God's son. It's a move from guardianship to full-fledged adoption. And with all the rights that come from being claimed or adopted by by another, now, this move, this move from guardian, uh, guardianship to adoption, I mean, it is, it is, it's, a gi- it's a giant move. It's a giant leap. I don't know if you've ever watched those videos that show adoption announcements. Sometimes it's young people letting someone um, in, from their life know, someone who's uh, functioned as a guardian in their life, letting them know that they would love for them to adopt them. Sometimes it's those who've been in the care of a young person. They've been in the role of a guardian, letting them know of their intention to adopt, to move from guardianship to adoption. You're now a full member of our family. I don't know if you've seen those. If you haven't, they're quite the tear fest. And um, yeah, I was going to let you off the hook, but then I changed my mind. So I'm going to show you one example. So. <laughs> I'm sorry, not sorry. So anyway, so (laughs) this is the power of adoption. A love that says, I choose you. I choose you. I believe uh, there's a similar longing uh, that exists in the human heart, in the spiritual, in the eternal. Ecclesiastes 3 says, we, we are told that God has set eternity in the human heart. It's that sense of in the midst of the day-to-day grind that there's got to be more than this. This is from Blaise Pascal, lived in the 1600s, mathematician, scientist, philosopher, theologian, right? A bunch of things. So this is in his defense of the Christian faith. He writes, 
What else does this craving, this helplessness proclaim, but that there was once in man a true happiness of which all that now remains is the empty print and trace. They used to talk differently. This he, try, this he tries in vain to fill with everything around him, seeking in things that are not there the help he cannot find in those that are. Though none can help, since this infinite abyss can be filled only with an infinite and immutable object, in other words, by God himself. Now it's from this, from this quotation that we have this idea of the God-shaped hole existing in the heart of every person who's ever lived. A vacuum that according to Paul in Galatians can be filled through the life and ministry of Jesus Christ. The apostle John, towards the top of his gospel, puts it like this. John 1 verse 11. It reads, he, Jesus, came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his aim, he gave the right to become what? Become children of God. Children born not of natural descent or of human decision or of a husband's will, but children born of God. Part of the good news of the gospel is that, that none of us, none of us have to be or to live from a spiritually abandoned or forsaken place. So then you might ask, what does this have to do with Good Friday? I'm so glad you asked. So we're going to go <laughs> to Hebrews. We're going to go, this is the one this weekend, kind of, Hebrews chapter 12. And this is a tale of two mountains right here, uh, beginning in verse chapter, Hebrews 12, reading verse 18. The author writes, you have not come to a mountain that can be touched and that is burning with fire, to darkness, gloom, and storm, to a trumpet blast, or to such a voice speaking words that those who heard it begged that no further word be spoken to them, because they could not bear what was commanded. If even an animal touches this mountain, it must be stoned to death. The sight was so terrifying that Moses said, I am trembling with fear. So this first mountain that we come to, it's not named outright here. It's clear from the context. The author is speaking of Mount Sinai, which is a place where Moses received the Ten, Commandments, the Ten Commandments and the law from God. So then we're going to go back to Exodus 19, beginning in verse 16, where it reads, On the morning of the third day, there was thunder and lightning with a thick cloud over the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast. Everyone in the camp trembled. Then Moses led the people out of the camp to meet with God, and they stood at the foot of the mountain. Mount Sinai was covered with smoke because the Lord descended on it in fire. The smoke billowed up from it like smoke from a furnace, and the whole mountain trembled violently. As the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke, and the voice of God answered him. The Lord descended to the top of Mount Sinai and called Moses to the top of the mountain. So Moses went up, and the Lord said to him, Go down and warn the people so they don't force their way through to see the Lord, and many of them perish. Even the priests who approach the Lord must consecrate themselves, or the Lord will break out against them. We're going to continue Exodus 20, verse 18. When the people saw the thunder and lightning and heard the trumpet and saw the mountain and smoke, they trembled with fear. They stayed at a distance and said to Moses, speak to us yourself and we will listen, but do not have God speak to us or we will what? We will die. Right. So this, this imagery, right, gets echoed. This is the imagery that's echoed with the first mountain that's described in Hebrews chapter 12. We'll absolutely do what God says, but if you don't mind, Moses, can you just go ahead and be the messenger going forward? Because the voice of God spoken directly to us will mean death. So we go back to Hebrews 12. Like I said, we have two mountains that represent two covenants. Mount Sinai represents the first or the old covenant. Now, the prophets of old spoke of a day when the old would give way uh, to the new. We find this from the prophet Jeremiah, chapter 31, verse 31. It says, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt, because they broke my covenant, though I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant I will make with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law, so that first section is describing Mount Sinai, basically, the first mountain. Uh, after that time, I'll put my law in the minds and, heart, minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God, and they will be my people. No longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, you know the Lord, because they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord, for I will forgive their wickedness, and I will remember their sins, what? They'll remember their sins no more. So one day the prophet writes, everything's going to change. There will no longer be a covenant that is etched in stone. 
The new covenant will be carved into the hearts of God's people. God declares, I will forgive wickedness. I will remember their sins no more. Okay, so let's look at the second mountain here. Verse 22. You have not come to this mountain. This is the mountain you've come to. You have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. You've come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly, to the church of the firstborn, whose names are written in heaven. You've come to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of the righteous made perfect. Woo! All right? That's a heavenly party that he's describing right there. It's a celebration. The author says that those who've attached themselves to the second mountain, this is their new reality in Christ. They have been spiritually, through Jesus, spiritually relocated from Sinai to Zion. Mount Zion physically in the Old Testament is connected to Jerusalem, but here it's created, uh, connected to something much greater. Mount Zion is part of the inheritance of those who become children of God. Mount Zion becomes Mount Zion becomes home for all those who are adopted into God's forever family. The first mountain is marked by terror and trembling and the unmistakable unapproachable holiness of God. Get close too close to that mountain and you die. It represents the old covenant of which Moses was the mediator. But through Jesus our King, we have come to the mountain of the new covenant, which is marked by grace and the victory of God. Now, for our purposes tonight, is verse 24 that really lit me up here. So I'm going to share it right now. So, so you've come, right, all these things you've come to at Mount Zion. To God, the judge of all, spirits of the righteous made perfect. Verse 24, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprink, sprinkled blood that speaks a what? A better, whoo, a better word. Yeah, I'll be, I'll be excited enough for all y'all, all right? <laughs> sprinkled blood that speaks a better word, has a better sermon, a better message than the blood of Abel. The blood of Jesus speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. Now, the blood of Abel, that takes us back to the first scene we have after Adam and Eve are cast out of the garden. You got two brothers, Cain and Abel. Both make sacrifices to God. One sacrifice is found acceptable to God. That would be Abel's. The other's, Cain's, is not. Cain is filled with anger and jealousy. He is warned by God. If he gives into his sin, it will lead to disaster, which it does. He takes his brother out to a field, and he kills him. And then we get this from Genesis 4, beginning of verse 9. The Lord said to Cain, where is your brother Abel? I don't know, he replied. Am I my brother's keeper? And the Lord said, what have you done? Listen, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Now you are under a curse, driven from the ground, which opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it will no longer yield its crops for you. You will be a restless wanderer on the earth. So we're going to see this on the screen right now. The blood of Abel, the blood of Jesus. The blood of Abel speaks of curse and sin and vengeance, and ultimately it cries out, look at what we have done to ourselves. The blood of Abel carries with it a sense of despair. But the blood of Jesus is different, right? The blood of Jesus, for all of eternity, it speaks not of curse and sin and vengeance, but it speaks of life and redemption. And ultimately, it cries out, look at what God has done for us. Not despair, but hope. So in our, like, biblically, in our sin, we are separated from God under the wrath of God, of which the penalty is sin. And on top of all that, in this life, apart from the blood of Jesus, Scripture tells us we are in bondage to sin, slave to sin. So our condition, apart from Jesus, the Mount Zion, the new covenant, penalty, wrath, death, bondage. But in Christ, God has met you and met me at every point of need. The Bible has a ton to say about what's been accomplished through the blood of Jesus. I'll give you a little bit. Acts 20, verse 28 says, Keep watch over yourselves and all the flock which the Holy Spirit has made, you an over, has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. Very church, purchased, redeemed, bought back by the blood of Jesus. 1 John 1, 7. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus' the Son purifies us from all sin. We are cleansed by the blood of Jesus. Hebrews 9, 14. How much more then will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our consciences from acts that lead to death so that we may serve the living God. We have new life as a result of his blood. In this passage, we got the entire Trinity 
The entire trinity at work in your rescue and your redemption. Colossians 1.19 says, For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him through and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. By his blood we have access to peace with God. In Hebrews 12, again, tale of two mountains. But... It's a third mount that ends up being the bridge between the two. It's a third mount that flings open the door to move us, relocate us from Mount Sinai to Mount Zion. It is that place known as Mount Calvary. And so we'll go back to Mark 15, where we started. Mark 15, verse 33. At noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And at three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lema sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The perfect son of God cries out his God forsakenness on his cross. He who knew no sin became sin on our behalf so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. This is a moment when Jesus cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It speaks of two things. It speaks to the horror of sin and to the great depths of God's love. Always know this. Jesus understands what it means to be and to feel utterly alone in this world. Cut off friends, family, even God, the Father. He was for, Jesus was forsaken so we would no longer have to be. Now, shortly after this, it says that Jesus breathed his last. And then we have verse 38. The curtain of the temple was torn in what? Torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood there in front of Jesus saw how he died, he said, surely this man was the son of God. Jesus' death on the cross. So he, he breathes his last, and then it triggers something. It triggers something in the temple. Now, for those of the Jewish faith at this time, like Jerusalem and specific, look, the temple is basically the umbilical cord connecting earth to the life of heaven. That's, that's basically the deal, the very life of heaven itself. So for them, Jerusalem is the most important city in the world, the temple, the most important building in the world, and the Holy of Holies, one room in this temple is the most important room in the world. The Holy of Holies was entered into only once a year. By, the Holy of Holies was entered by the high, high priest on Yom Kippur or the Day of Atonement. In the temple, there was a veil, a curtain that separated this Holy of Holies which was believed to be the dwelling place of God, it separated the Holy of Holies from the rest of the temple that could be inhabited by other people. To go beyond the veil was death. When Jesus breathed his last on the cross, we're told in that moment, the temple curtain was torn in two from top to bottom. Matthew's gospel tells us that was accompanied by earthquakes, rock splitting, and the release of resurrection life. The tearing of the curtain when that curtain is torn from top to bottom, it is simultaneously reflective of the grief of God the Father just rending his garments. But also as this moment, there is this moment where the spirit of God is then released into the world. There is going to be in that moment when that curtain is torn, there is a, going to be a relocation of the presence of God. He's going to move from a place to a people. God's spirit's going to be everywhere. And this is going to get inaugurated right at Pentecost in the book of Acts. From this point forward, as Paul says in Acts 17, the God who made the world and everything in it does not live in temples built by human hands. And it happens when the, with the sacrifice of Jesus. It changed everything, which is why we're here tonight. And so I, I, what I would want you to understand, this is what I want you to understand, because you're all kind of nodding in agreement, but this is what I want you to understand. Jesus did not go to the cross, take on the penalty of our curse, pour out his blood in his life just so that we could sort of nod our heads over what we believe to be true. He sacrificed himself in fulfillment of the promises of God to fling open the door for you and me to be able to fully, not just know, but experience forgiveness, healing, and freedom. And what it's like when the life of heaven reaches and is activated in a human heart, in a human being, from the top of your head to the bottom of your feet. When we realize that because of Jesus, God no longer sees us or relates to us based on the moments that you and I are most ashamed of, but he now sees us through the lens of the obedient sacrifice, but he now sees us through the lens of his son, which is why we can receive it is meant to re release within us worship and joy and gratitude. The I'm sweating up here, man. I need like a, someone give me a, whew. 
The blood of Jesus speaks a better word. It just speaks a better word. It just does. There's many in our world, many pe- us, many people we love, that if you cut them, they're just bleeding out fear. They're bleeding out anger. They're bleeding out anxiety. They're bleeding out resentment. They're bleeding out pride, selfishness, greed, and all of those voices speak to us as well, but they don't speak life over us. They don't speak God's best over us, but the blood of Jesus speaks a better word than all of that. It declares tonight, I love you. I forgive you. I cleanse you. I rescue you. I keep you and protect you. You'll always be mine, and I will always be with you. I feel like I should wrap it up, but I'm not going to. So... I'm almost, so I absolutely, no, nah, it's all good. I, look, I absolutely do believe that there is a God-shaped hole inside of every one of us. But when I read the story this week, what hit me is that there appears to be a sort of humanity-shaped hole in the heart of God as well. Now, I don't mean in saying that, that the God of all the universe needs us in the same way that we need him. I don't mean that. But it is absolutely clear that he has chosen us. And so to be true to himself, to his promises, his character, God has made a way where there was no way through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And that is what makes Good Friday good. All right. So, okay. Now, get the team on up here. Thanks, brother. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah love you guys. So um, we're going to close our time in worship. And as our, time, our team leads us, there's going to be elements for communion. They, we're going to take communion family style. So they're going to get passed across the rows here. So take those, hold on to them. Um, if you're able to just go ahead and please stand and uh, grab those, hold on to them, and then I'll come back up and I will lead us at some point here. This is from uh, the Apostle Paul. It reads, For I received from the Lord what I also pass on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he given thanks, he broke it and he said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Take and eat. same way after supper he took the cup saying this cup is the new covenant in my blood 
Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Take and drink. y'all tonight. Um, so Friday, Friday tragedy, Sunday, joy, celebration. So then what happens Saturday, right? Saturday, Saturday's that in between. Saturday is that space of waiting. For us watching and waiting for those first disciples, it was a space of grief, grief, some hoping but not knowing. 
For us, Saturday is a space where we can look towards Sunday knowing that it's through Jesus Christ that we have been relocated from Sinai to Zion through what he did on Calvary. And so we can just have gratitude all day tomorrow until we come back together and hang out and celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so it's supposed to rain a little bit this weekend. So just a quick heads up. So like for the first, so if you like, we do have this, we've had this inform, we've done sunrise service every year since we planned it. We're going to go ahead because just like the headache, like I can be stubborn, but I'm learning to try to not be stubborn about the wrong things. And so I don't think stubbornness is always a bad thing, but I won't be stubborn about the wrong things. So we're going to do sunrise service here. And if it's raining, we'll do it in the video cafe. And if it's not, then we're going to go outside. All right. And so that'll be, that'll be how that works. All right. As far as Sunday. And then we'll have all of our other gather- gatherings, 8, 30, 10, 11, 30, um, right here. Like we mentioned, anyone who park across the street, really appreciate it. You know, people are going to bring umbrellas. We're just going to try to be ready to be great hosts to our community and just be praying for, man, God lost several Easter's. He's just done stuff where then people got baptized just a couple weeks later who we'd never met before, you know, kind of thing. And so just really, you know, um, trusting that God has gone before, not just flip side, but all of his churches all throughout this community. And, and he's just going to do the things that only God can do. And so really honored to be on the journey with every one of you. So I'd like to close out with a blessing. So if you join me. Um, Father God, we just love you. We thank you. There, again, there's no one like you, Father. There's no one like you. We thank you abundantly, Lord, for what you've done for us through your son, Jesus Christ. Nothing but gratitude, Lord, in our hearts. And so we want to live our lives in response to the good things that you've done for us, Lord. We thank you that the blood of Jesus, it just speaks a better word, Lord. It speaks a better word than any of the other voices that cry out to us in this world. The blood of Jesus speaks a better word, gives us a, be- it's a better voice, a better story, God. And we want to live in the center of that story. And so I lift up my brothers and sisters here. And I pray that the reality of Christ crucified, Christ buried, and Christ resurrected would go deep into their hearts, Father God. And we love you, we thank you, and it's in the great name of Jesus Christ that all of us prayed and all of us agree said, Amen. Amen. God bless you. <laughs>